All right, welcome back. We're in the final chapter of the World's Toughest Mutter Cliff Notes 2023. Jason Rouleau is on the line with me. If you don't know who he is, go back and listen to episode number one, where I spent two minutes talking about all of his amazing, impressive uh, <laughs> accomplishments. He's also a, are you like a nutrition scientist or an exercise physiologist or are you well, something? I, I performance enhancement specialist, if you want to call it that. Yeah. I, I want a personal, you know, where I, company. you know, where I need some performance enhancements. Yeah. <laughs> Is this uh, you or your wife talking, my man? <laughs> the, the uh, the it only took me four. Ep- it only took me four episodes to say something really inappropriate. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So yeah, I do do I do this for a living. So you know, I'm kind of a geek about uh, researching all this stuff, and I've been researching it all throughout the time frame. And th- today's uh, this topic, thermal regulation. Ever since my first world's toughest in 2012, where life sucked. Uh, It was like my passion to figure out how can I make this not suck as bad for myself. And then it turns out that, uh, you know, I can help other people with that. So I spent a lot of time researching this particular thing, thermal regulation, making sure people understand what's happening with the body and how you can kind of counter that when we get into an event like this. This event is like nothing else that most people ever face in any type of a racing situation. So it's uh, fairly complicated, but we're going to make it simple. I think I'd like to give a great example, okay, uh, about our about our old friend. So do you remember last year there was a gentleman that came in, very accomplished runner, very fast runner, who said, I'm going to run 125 miles, and this is how I'm going to do it. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember okay. it. Okay, so uh, he quit because he got too cold. So can you explain what happened and what possibly could have been done to prevent it because i think that's a good example because you might be you might be listening to this and you're actually not just like some newbie off the couch you're like a really experienced ultra runner but you've never done world's toughest yeah so uh the the general thing uh and and just ultra runners in general they they don't all they're doing is running so they're prop even if it's raining, but there are there are there are examples of like Boston Marathon and things where people get caught in the cold, they get caught in the wind. Uh, I don't remember what year that was. That wasn't that long ago, three or four years ago, Boston Marathon. They had a lot of wind and rain and knocked a bunch of the top racers out, Sage Canada and a couple of the other racers out due to hypothermia. Um, but the the main key is that most racing environments, yes, you get you slow down at night. Yes. You get tired. Yes, all this stuff. But you're not submerging yourself repeatedly in water. And the submersions in in worlds and and trying to run every time, if you can't run any faster, uh, meaning your physical exertion level or your pacing strategy, whatever it is, will not allow you to run faster to warm up more. um, Or maybe it's just general fatigue. You're going to constantly get progressively more and more cold. Uh, the problem that he had last year is he came out with a pacing strategy that was completely unrealistic. And as you do an obstacle, I don't think a lot of people realize. And if you're new to this, when you do an obstacle, pay attention what happens after you do the obstacle. It can be something simple. But at about midnight, you're going to get out of breath doing something that seems relatively simple. Why did you get out of breath? Man, that wasn't that hard. Why did I get out of breath? Because it took more out of you than you really realized. Well, the the over time, all these different obstacles that take more and more out of you. If you're an a, you're an ultra runner and you do one lap, okay, no big deal. But the progressive nature of the core of the course, every time we're going to do this funky monkey or this upper body obstacle, it's going to wear us down just a little bit, a little, little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Uh, those all have an effect. So he was just getting more and more tired than he realized he was getting. And then as soon as we started putting him in water, he, his body temperature dropped and then getting it back up was nearly impossible because as soon as he got it back up, he had to get water again. And it just, if you're not used to that, that constant submersion, understand this, and this is the first thing you have to remember about a tough mutter versus a Spartan race or a Spartan ultra, something like that, where you're going to be constantly submerged in water. Water takes drops your body temperature 30 times faster than the air does. So if you're getting in the water, uh, I always look at how many water obstacles, possible submersions we have uh, at Tough Mudder. And if there's 20 obstacles, we're probably going to have at least five of them where you're going to be submerged for sure. 
Uh, maybe another three or four where there's possible submersion if you fail. Uh, so if you're going in one out of every four obstacles, uh, you're getting cold, you're getting wet. Uh, that means you're you're dropping your body temperature uh, at least four or five times every lap. Uh, it's going to be eventually going to hit a wall where you can't, you just can't get warm. So you got to make sure that you are doing, staying ahead of the game and not getting too cold uh, too early, because if you do that, you'll be in trouble later on in the race. So I brought up for those watching, I brought up the, uh, this is Anthony Kunkel, who uh, I had big issues with before the race because he was talking so much. And then I talked to him afterwards and I ended up really liking the guy, but this is a great <laughs> example. Okay. First lap 2939, probably the fastest green mile green bib lap we've ever had right first place next lap 31 45 first place next lap 35 39 still in first place and by the time we hit lap eight it's getting colder more obstacles are turned on we haven't even talked about that we'll get into that when the with the race the the location and the obstacles but he starts doing hour laps by lap 10 and he's probably not in first place anymore then uh and he was in the pit really quick on all these by lap 12, he's in the pit for a half an hour trying to get warm. And after that lap, right. he didn't come back out till the morning. Now, if we quickly uh, swap that with, let's say, the winner of the race, DJ Fox, right? He's, yeah, and he started slow as far as I remember. He, well, he was he's, not doing some, he's doing some pretty quick laps, right, well, early on. Well, slow, relatively speaking. He was, like, way back in the pack until, like, right. halfway through the night. Right. So half of you the night, he's, I think, probably in sixth or seventh. Right. And he's yeah, doing about yeah, an hour 14. And then between laps 10 and 20, which are the ones that fucking matter. Right. The hardest part yeah. of the race when everybody's staying in bed, you can see how consistent he is. 114, 118, 123, 122, 123, 130, 122. Now, that's what you want yours to look like. You don't want it to look like fast, 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 and then slow, slow, slow out of the race. And that's kind of the two ways it can go. So yeah. uh, it's like we say in an ultra, right? Start slow and then get slower. Like just yeah. keep it steady. The the general thing I tell, what, what I plan on is that once I hit, once the dark comes, because you're going to slow down because of no light and that type of stuff, you uh, are generally going to slow your laps about 10 or 15 minutes a lap. Uh, if you just say 10 minutes a lap, if you drop every pace, 10 minutes a lap, figure that by the end of, by the middle of the night, if you were running, you know, hour and 20 hour thirties at the beginning, you know, or not in the beginning, but I mean, once the obstacles start opening, uh, you're probably going to be running two to two ten, maybe two fifteen in the middle of the night, uh, just because you're progressively getting more tired. But the key is that you got to be progressive in your plan to stay warm. And you can't get behind the eight ball. That does not mean try to get way ahead of it and don't be cold. I, I mentioned this in a previous podcast we had. The idea is to be comfortably cold. That means you're not freezing your butt off, but at the same time, you're never warm. You don't want to be warm because warm tells the body you need to cool itself. The body's first line of defense is always to not get too overheated. So if it sees that you're getting too warm, it tries to cool you. And then you're going the wrong direction because your body's trying to drop body temperature. We don't want that. So you want to be comfortable. Yeah, don't can we just say that just don't start in a wetsuit? Don't yeah. start in a wetsuit. It's it'll make you slow. It's too hot. The amount of 15 minutes you're gonna save later is not worth it. Start in either shorts or or what do you call it? Tights, but do not yeah. start in a wetsuit. Yeah, just plan to be progressive. And, you know, if you start getting a little cold, add a layer, just a little layer. Don't add a bunch, just add a little, add a hat, add some rug mitts, add this, just add progressively. And then when it's time to get in a wetsuit at, you know, six o'clock when it gets dark, that's when you do, that's when you put that on. Um, you know, you you can, if you have a Neptune, you add your Neptune and then put some heat in it, put your jacket on and then stay in that until, okay, I need to put my wetsuit on. I'm going to put that on, but don't put it all on. Just put the wetsuit on. And then take your hat off. And then, okay, now I'm getting a little cold. I'm going to put my hat back on. And then, you know, so you're progressively trying to stay a little bit warmer and a little bit warmer and a little bit warmer. Not just, I want to be comfortable. Hey, hey, this race ain't about being comfortable. It's about not, it's about making the whole way, right? So uh, you're not going to be comfortable. That's the whole, that's kind of the thing. Do you want, uh, I want you to talk about, you said, 
you said you that first year you were miserable. Can you tell me what you did do in 2012? What your plan, quote unquote, was in 2012, but, and then what so, happened? Yeah. Okay. So we came out with the idea that we were going to uh, power hike the majority of the race because we couldn't run for 24 hours. The guys that I was with, I met at this course. Uh, you know, we uh, we were going to power hike most of the race. So. We came out. It was a little cool at the start, but it wasn't cold, so we didn't have wetsuits on and stuff like that. Um, it was like 60, maybe low 60s in in, in Jersey. And uh, But what I had was a shorty and uh, an under thing, kind of like a, a – it's a, called a lava core suit, but it's kind of like frog skins. I had that. I had a, a three mil wetsuit, and I had a shorty. So those were my three layering options, and I had like a, a little jacket put on over the top of it. Um, the problem was, is that one of the guys I was rock, I was hiking with, but I, he injured his knee on an obstacle, probably about 5 PM. So he was moving really slow. So it got to the point where I would run ahead a hundred yards and do 10 burpees waiting for him and the other guy to catch up. And I was doing this throughout the night. Cause I was freezing my, I could barely feel my hands. I mean, it was bad. So uh, that was the that was the only thing, and you know it's the only race that I quote unquote didn't D- DNF because Stump Mutter didn't have an option like to penalty out. So there was one particular obstacle that was freezing over. I watched the guy fall from the top and land in the water, about a foot of water on his what looked like his head, and I'm like I'm not doing that obstacle. So you either had the option of sitting there and waiting for them to close the obstacle, which we didn't know was going to happen or not, or quit so eventually it got to the point where we're like you know what i'm not doing that obstacle it's too dangerous so we're done and they you know it it was two o'clock in the morning and i was like i'm not doing that obstacle i'm afraid i'm gonna die but they didn't have a way to penalty out that was just the way life was oh and this by the way there were 12 mile loops so when you started a lap you were gonna be out on the lap for four hours so or you know however many three or four hours so it was gonna take a while so but i was just freezing i mean i couldn't feel my fingers i ended up having peripheral neuropathy in my fingertips for three months afterwards uh didn't get frostbite but i just knew i did not want to be cold like that ever again so i made sure that i had the right gear to to prevent that um but you got to know that you have two different environments that you're trying to counter you got the environment of inside your wetsuit when you're in the water and then outside of the water you're going to need something to protect your wetsuit from the outside air because your wetsuit is designed to keep the water that's close to your skin warm. So you're in the water. It's going to keep you warm. Outside it's not going to do anything. Now you're wet and you have nothing to protect you from the outside air. So that's where you need your jacket, maybe some kind of wind pants on the outside of your, or your outside of your wetsuit or something like that's not necessarily required but the key is is understand you need something to protect your wetsuit from the cold air so you have two different environments but you need to be progressive in nature and making sure you're adding these layers progressively throughout i've only overheated once that was in vegas put the wetsuit on too soon because i didn't have a pit crew i was like man i gotta put this on because i'm not gonna have anybody to help me out and this is one of somebody's available i put it on and by the time i got to the top of the hill i was delirious i was literally delirious uh, and I literally walked off course 300 yards to get to the lake to crawl into the lake and cool off because I, I could barely see straight. So uh, I vowed that's never going to happen again. It didn't end up benefiting me in the long run in the race anyway. So, you know, you would rather be slightly cold or a little cold than overheated, put it that way. Okay. So um, that's why I say progressively warm, just, uh, you know, understand that you don't want to get too cold but you also don't want to get too hot so just have a plan to what you're going to progressively add as you go well and if you don't have the budget for multiple suits i would recommend doing what keith taught me all these years ago and that's a three two right so that's three millimeters over the torso and two millimeters on the extremities and then you can add layers to that right Yep. You can also take off layers, right? And that's what I did throughout the night. Obviously, I had a shirt underneath, so I wouldn't get, you know, uh, whatever I started with. And yeah, you want a base layer, uh, you know, a base layer type of thing. So obviously. So the three, two, and that cap, and then, like you said, cap on, cap off, uh, layers on, layers off. By 10 o'clock the next morning, 
I did not have the back zip. So I did, I did the, or the front zip. So I did the back zip and had it hanging down, but I walked that last lap anyway. I didn't care, but yes, yep. highly recommend the three, two instead of a three, two and a five, four and a shorty. If you got all that money and you can do it, go for it. But I like the three, two as my kind of base piece of equipment. Yeah. I mean, and that's great. Uh, like I said, I think I, I mentioned in one of the other podcasts, a one mil neoprene shirt, a lot cheaper than, a uh, than a frog skin, which is some, uh, sometimes difficult to get on especially for me so i have a one mil wetsuit shirt that is really stretchy and i use that as the first layer of defense and then i'll put a jacket on over that and then i'll i can layer my wetsuits over the top of that it doesn't really affect me all that much uh but if you've got one of those or you've got a a, a zip up uh neoprene vest those are good relatively cheap options and then you can have your one three two full wetsuit and you're you should be good to go it's just being able to add those little layers the the vest you can either put on underneath or over the top of your wetsuit and take that off if you you know like i'm getting a little hot or you can unzip it it's a front zip my buddies is a front zip so you just unzips it and zips it down a little bit and it could help cool them off a little bit so those are just options that give you the ability to progressively get warmer but also progressively get colder or cooler and uh you know just give you options during the race so, um, and let's see, uh, also understand this is the other part that I, I think is, it starts to happen. Which most people don't realize as you get more and more tired, your body is less and less adept at dealing with temperature change. So this is probably what happened to Kunkel during the race. You get tired and your body's like, what the hell? So it, it no longer can function correctly at keeping you moving at a good speed and keeping you warm because it has to do one or the other. And it may be that it's going to end your race fairly quickly because you no longer, now you hit a wall. Uh, the other thing that happens is if you get dehydrated or as you get more and more glycogen burn, your body's water content decreases. Think about this. If you try to heat up, boil a pot of water versus boiling a cup of water, it takes a lot longer, right? Same thing happens when you try to cool the water. If you dehydrate something, you have less water, it's going to freeze faster if you put it in the refrigerator. The same thing happens to you. As you decrease your body water content, you get colder faster. So if you ever, uh, at a bodybuilding contest, when we go backstage, all the bodybuilders are freezing their butt off. They're sweating out on stage because it's hot because you got these lights. But backstage, they're freezing their butt off because they're all really dehydrated. So it, the same thing happens when we race. As we get more and more dehydrated, as we burn more and more glycogen, our body wa body water content drops, which makes us more easily to get, it makes us easier. To, it gets easier to get cold, basically. So all these things are happening at the same time in an ultra race. So you just got to have that thought process. And I'm not the same at 6 p.m. as I am at 6 a.m. I have been many races where I should be warm at noon. I'm still in a full wetsuit or a full, you know, all my gear. Why? Because my body's freaking out. So even though I'm walking around at 65 degrees, I'm still freezing my butt off. Everybody's been done at the race. They're sitting in the pit and they're still shivering, wearing a sweatshirt at 65 degrees. They're like, why is that? Well, because your body's all screwed up. I After the race, Evan prepares and I always talk about it. After the race, there's going to be a few days where you'll have thermal regulation issues where you go from cold to hot flash, cold to hot flash, cold to hot flash periodically throughout the day. It's just your body's trying to readjust and it's all screwed up. So just know it's going to happen. It might happen during the middle of the night and it's going to suck if it does. All right. Anything else on that topic? I think it's good. You know, if people got other questions, they can feel free to contact me. I'm, I'm happy to, to share a lot of information. It's just, we want to make sure people understand what's, what's going to happen as they, as they go through it. Well, it would be great if you, if you're watching this on YouTube, it would be great if you could ask right on the, uh, right in the link, right in the link, because then people, you can answer in the links and then everyone sees yep. them, right? Usually if someone has a exactly. question, there's a lot of questions. Um, well, all right, man, we will be back with the final part when we, when the map and obstacles are announced, which is going to be the week of, I mean, it's going to be pretty quick to do that one. Yep. Yep. Hey, I'm, I'm in for it. And people, I'm going to be doing the research anyway. I might as well be sharing the information. <laughs>